Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. First, I would like to uh, thank my colleagues, the USC Annenberg Journalism and Public Relations Faculty. It has been a great, great privilege to be part of this remarkable team of uh, journalism professors. The discipline, passion, and work ethic of each of these students is a testament to your devotion to the noble art of teaching. So congratulations to you as well on this graduation day. I am uh, truly honored to be here this morning with the first generation of journalists and public relations professionals to graduate from USC during a particularly difficult and thought-provoking time for both our crafts. For the first time in modern American history, we face a government that is openly hostile to what we do. This should not be taken lightly. A healthy and vibrant democracy is intimately related to a healthy and vibrant public discourse. And believe me, I would know. I am Mexican, like Willow said, and in Mexico, being a journalist, an honest journalist, has always been a challenge. For years, governments in Mexico at every level have worked to undermine, diminish, and threaten our profession. Active censorship and self-censorship, which can be just as damaging sometimes, obstructs what we do every single day. And now, in the age of terror that has wounded so many places in my country, being a journalist has become a deadly endeavor for too many of my colleagues, of our colleagues, of your colleagues. The one lesson I have learned from journalism's plight in my home country, and it's an important one, is that no one, no one but the autocratically inclined, corrupt politicians, messianic figures, criminal organizations, no one but them benefits from a weakened journalistic community, from weakening from weakening our capacity to tell a trustworthy, captivating, and truthful story. Keep that in mind. Now, in the United States, we are facing some of those same threats. So make no mistake, everyone, you are graduating in a tough, rough, aggressively secretive, morally demanding time. And to this I say, congratulations. What better time to be a journalist, a PR professional, a storyteller, a communicator? What better time to be out there seeking the truth, asking uncomfortable questions, holding the powerful accountable, sniffing for that unmistakable stench of corruption and impunity? No better time. You have chosen wisely, and I'm proud of you. The question you now face is, what to do next? I imagine many of you are already looking forward to facing our favorite prey, my favorite prey, politicians. <laughs> They're wonderful. <laughs> I don't blame you, I don't blame you. There are few things more entertaining and fulfilling and important than successfully confronting a powerful political figure. I know what that feels like. Three years ago, I uh, asked during an interview, I asked Enrique Peña Nieto, the president of Mexico, about the possibility of the famous El Chapo Guzman, whom Peña Nieto had just captured, escaping from prison once again. The president of Mexico told me it would be impossible for that to happen. <laughs> he looked me in the eye and he said, it would be truly unforgivable. That were his exact words. Truly unforgivable, nice, meaty words to hear from the mouth of a president. So you can imagine my journalistic glee when just a few months later, El Chapo climbed down from his cell into a tunnel and fled. <laughs> Peña Nieto's words in that interview with me haunted him for a while, for a long time, 
even after he managed to catch Guzman again. So it was fulfilling. There's a deep satisfaction in holding the powerful accountable, in showing them the boundaries of their power, the clear boundaries of their power, in being their fair but implacable adversary. So I really don't blame you if your dream is to go to Washington and run around the halls of Congress, crafting clever spin, setting the agenda, or, pe or perhaps even sitting inside the White House briefing room one day, stomping Sean Spicer <laughs> with a with a nifty, well-informed question. It's not that hard. <laughs> if, you, if, you chose, if you chose any of that, I wouldn't blame you. I understand the allure of politics and political reporting. But let me suggest today a different path. If what you want is to take a stand against nativism, against racism, against prejudice, against half-truths, against the assault on minorities, against dark money in politics, against misogyny, against corruption, against poverty and inequality, against that insulting, infuriating label that calls what we do fake, focus not on the powerful, but on the powerless. I I personally became a journalist not to tell the story of the powerful and visible, but to tell the story of the powerless and invisible. I believe, for example, and my students, some of you are here, I believe, for example, in the significance of telling the story of an immigrant, a deeply religious father of eight daughters, who decided to emigrate to a country he deeply and genuinely admired and which he thought would provide a safe, respectful place to bring up eight young women. An immigrant who still works to this day with his hands as a contractor, as a builder, a man who built his own house and has managed to raise poised, elegant, and incredibly productive American women like you. Even if five of them are undocumented. His story is more important than that of any politician. His name is Luis Canales. I believe in the significance of the story of an undocumented immigrant, a cheerleading, dancing high school junior who dreams of going to college for a degree in women's studies and defines herself as a fierce feminist who just might also want to be like Beyonce and can't imagine herself going back to Mexico, a girl who embodies everything that's good and admirable about American womanhood, and yet still must live with the fact that she might not be able to legally work in this country or go to the college of her choosing in this country, a country she rightfully considers her own. Her name is Dalia Carmona. Her story is more important than that of any politician. I believe in the significance of the story of an immigrant, a giant of a man who has worked 18 hours a day for the last 30 years of his life just to achieve his dream of owning a business, a wonderful, delicious bakery in Los Angeles in which he mostly employs undocumented immigrants because he says everyone deserves a better life in the United States. A man who through his hard work, through his quintessentially, and this is crucial, guys, through his quintessentially American hard work, sent his kids to college and bought the house he grew up in back in Mexico for his ailing mother. His name is Agustin Aleman. And yes, his story is more important than that of any politician. The only way to really counter prejudice is to uncover its consequences, its social, emotional, and cultural consequences. And you can only do that with the power, the immense power of storytelling. And believe me, people want to tell their stories. Don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Five years ago, working for Univision, I bought a small plastic round table at Home Depot, along with a couple of plastic chairs and a foldable cart 
to carry them around. I began to set up the table on corners chosen completely at random all around Los Angeles with two cameras a safe distance away. Then I sat and asked people to join me. I wanted only one thing, to ask them about their lives. Nothing more, but nothing less. No notes, no pre-production, no makeup for TV, no suit, no tie, no fancy handkerchief, no news anchor histrionics, nothing. Only essential community storytelling. I didn't know what would happen. I thought maybe people would just stand up after the first few questions. Maybe, I thought, some might even feel insulted by my prodding. The exact opposite happened. People opened like books suddenly dropped on the floor. They spoke of their parents and grandparents and the sights and sounds of their childhoods. They reminisced about the last time they saw the small towns they were born in, never to return. They told me about their plight across the border, carrying their children in their arms, children who would grow up here as American, as American as any child born a citizen. And then they spoke of their lives in this blessed country, the United States, a country they appreciate, they value, a country they love, a country, by the way, they love just as much as the Irish, the Italians, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Germans, who all came before them. They told me of the businesses they had managed to build, of learning a language that was not their own, of singing the Star Spangled Banner, of finding a place in a community that slowly but surely became home. And they spoke proudly of their children, like you guys, going to college, earning a scholarship, like some of you guys, while their parents worked two or three jobs at a factory just up the street right here, or a kitchen, or even the fields of the Central Valley. These are the stories I've heard, hundreds of them, each one a tiny place of the great American tapestry, each one an affirmation of the great American ideal, and yes, yes, each one a refutation of nativist prejudice. And that is why I urge you to resist the call for now, resist the call of the great political bubble. And that is why I urge you to also resist the call of the four oppressive walls of the TV studio. Rein in your ego. Remember that you, as journalists and storytellers, practice what should be the humblest, humblest of professions. Because in the end, we ask questions. We only ask questions. We don't offer opinions, we offer facts. No opinion, no opinion has ever had greater significance than a real in-depth investigation. Think about it. There is simply no opinion equivalent to the Watergate investigation. And that's precisely why, as storytellers, we confront the abuse of power not through activism, but through exploration. We mount relentless and fierce and brave opposition to the abuse of power, not through our opinions, but through our questions, our prodding, and our uncovering. A while ago, maybe 20 years ago, I faced a particularly difficult story about corruption in Mexico. I didn't know what to do with my sources or the story I, I saw unfolding in front of my eyes. When I asked a colleague and dear friend of mine for advice, he cryptically told me, ante la duda, haz periodismo. When in doubt, go be a journalist. I hated him then because the last thing I needed was some sort of abstract Yoda-like advice. <laughs> but he was right. When in doubt, go be a journalist. Go out there, grab a camera, grab a microphone, but most of all, grab pen and paper, look people in the eye, listen to them, really listen to them, ask them about their lives, take them back to childhood, ask about their dreams and anxieties, uncover 
their everyday struggles, break bread with them, find out where and how they fit in this great, great puzzle that is American life. Go out there and discover the common bonds that unite us all in an acrimonious time, in a time of division, anger, and bitterness. Believe me, there is no greater calling. So go and tell the story. Tell the story, not of the powerful, but of the powerless. Make the invisible visible. When in doubt, indeed, go be a journalist. Go tell a story. But most of all, my friends, fight on.